Yeah, now I'm back. <laughs> okay. So don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, guys. And save the date for the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery. It's going to be in 2023 in Washington, D.C., August and September. This is going to be an amazing meeting. You should all be there with us. So we are going to have our uh, fetal cardiology meeting on the 26th. And it's going to be very nice. Dr. Rima uh, is uh, putting together a nice uh, uh, program. So please uh, be with us on the 26th of May. <clears throat> and then on the 27th, we have Dr. Anderson, uh, Diane, Adrian, and Justine talking about pulmonary venous anomalies. It's going to be very nice. Uh, this new series of Dr. Uh, Anderson has been uh, amazing with the correlation of the 3D CT scan. And, and it's, it's very nice. I think you all should uh, uh, watch. And, uh, and the Dr. Norman just told me that he's, he wants uh, to have a new meeting. He wants to have a new uh, a lecture about absent anomaly. So the correlations of morphology and echo on absence anomaly. Hopefully, we're going to be able to do this in June or July. And so uh, keep an eye on our uh, social media for sure you're going to hear about that. And now I'm very happy to have Dr. Mary Cohen with us today. She's going to talk about pre and post operative imaging of transposition. And Mary, thank you very much. We all love you. We all love your lectures. You explain in such an easy way, such complex a topic. So thank you very much to be with us today. And guys, please type your questions on the Q&A chat box. Uh, Dr. Mary and is going to be very happy to answer your questions that we have with us today, Dr. Silverman, as well as a panelist. So they both are going to uh, make this meeting very nice. See you soon, guys. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you, Sasha. And um, uh, let me just share my screen. And please, uh, someone tell me that you can see the slides. Yes? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Just want to make sure. Just, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm very happy to be back with the Congenital Heart Academy uh, to, to give uh, you another lecture. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about transposition of the great arteries, pre and post operative echo assessment. Obviously, we use other modalities when we're uh, imaging patients with transposition of the great arteries. And I direct you towards this guideline that we wrote um, about uh, six years ago for the uh, Journal of American Society of Echocardiography, which really gives a very comprehensive uh, review of all the different modalities we use and the indications for those modalities in imaging patients pre and postoperatively with transposition of the great arteries. Uh, I'm going to focus my attentions today on echocardiography. Um, and so when we talk about transposition of the great arteries, um, it's a ventriculo arterial assignment. I like to use the word assignment rather than alignment because sometimes it's actually quite challenging to determine which uh, ventricle a great artery is, is coming from. Um, but what's somewhat unique about transposition in contrast to other anomalies like this, like double outlet, is that transposition is also a physiologic state. So it's an anatomic reality as well as a physiologic state. Uh, in, in Andersonian terms, we say that it is atrioventricular concordance with ventriculo arterial discordance. And if you use von Pragian terms, in situs solidus, we uh, typically uh, consider this a D-looped heart. In situs inversus, it's an L-looped heart. So some people use the term D-transposition of the great arteries. And what they're referring to is the looping of the ventricles. Um, but because it can be very much confused with corrected transposition, which we will not be covering today, um, we tend to use the standard term transposition of the great arteries when we're referring, referring to atrioventricular concordance with ventricular arterial discordance. <clears throat> and there's the simple form of transposition where you have either no VSD, intact ventricular septum, or an insignificant VSD, and about half of the patients will have simple form. And then you can have complex forms of the disease where you have large or complicated or multiple ventricular septal defects uh, at plus or minus outflow tract obstruction, and that certainly adds complexity. I'm, I noted before that transposition is 
an anatomic reality as well as a physiology. And the physiology is that you have a parallel circulation. And what's unique about transposition physiology is that you have high pulmonary blood flow, but you're blue, which seems uh, difficult for people to understand sometimes. And that is because you have low effective pulmonary blood flow. The blood in the systemic vein, the SVC and IVC, does not get oxygenated and returned to the pulmonary vein because of the parallel circulation. And so we rely on mixing at multiple levels, either at the PDA, at the atrial septum, or at the ventricular level to allow for mixing of blood to get some effective pulmonary blood flow. And it turns out that the atrial communication is the most effective. So some patients with ventricular septal defects will have poor mixing. Uh, and if the atrial septum is intact, usually those patients get in trouble with cyanosis. There are a variety of surgeries that we can consider in patients who have transposition. Obviously, in this day and age, the arterial switch operation, plus or minus the Lecompte maneuver, are performed in patients who have intact ventricular septum, as well as simple forms of VSD, such as perimembranous, muscular, or outlet VSDs. We then uh, consider doing another operation in patients who have transposition with a posterior malalignment VSD with pulmonary outflow tract obstruction. Because the pulmonary outflow is narrowed, you can't do an arterial switch. And these patients will, are more likely to undergo a Resteli or a Nikaido type of procedure. In the patients who have anterior malalignment VSD with, with or without coarctation, they usually can undergo an arterial switch operation, but it is usually much more complicated with VSD closure, potentially opening up the right ventricular outflow tract, similar to what we do for tetralogy of Fallot. And many of these patients will have arch obstruction or arch hypoplasia that will also need to be addressed. So that's a quite a large operation. And then finally, uh, the atrial switch operation, which was standard of care from the 60s through the 80s, is now really uh, used only in patients who have late diagnosis where the left ventricle cannot perform as, a, as the systemic pump. So we'll focus our attentions now on preoperative imaging. And uh, I draw your attention to this, this figure or chart from our guideline that I just uh, uh, showed you, which really shows you all the different views we use to make this diagnosis, the structures that we're identifying in those views, as well as what we're really looking for. Um, so uh, please refer to that. And I just want to uh, make a comment about conal anatomy, which is really emphasized in the von Prague um, uh, segmental anatomy. So the conal, conus, as you are aware, is the muscle that sits under a semilunar valve. In the normal heart, uh, you have subpulmonary uh, infundibulum or conus only, and there's mitral to aortic fibrous continuity. And the most typical conal anatomy in transposition is where you have subaortic conus only, and there's typically mitral to pulmonary fibrous continuity. So that's the typical form you see uh, over here. But there are a variety of other types of conal anatomy. And in fact, in transposition, you can have any conal anatomy. So subaortic conus only, bilateral conus, bilaterally absent conus, or the very rare case of where you have transposition with a posterior aorta, exquisitely rare, and those patients tend to have subpulmonary conus only. So just to bring your attention to that, it's something that we certainly pay attention to when we're describing the heart from a von Pragian perspective. And we start our imaging in our institution in the subxiphoid view, um, but you can also, of course, start in the parasternal view. And when you do, uh, you'll make an instant diagnosis of transposition. You can see in this echo clip that you can see the atrial septum. In this particular case, as you see this, the sweep come around again, you'll see that the atrial septum primum is flopping around because this patient has had a balloon septostomy, but you'll also immediately see the pulmonary artery arising from the left ventricle and the aorta arising from the right ventricle, instantaneous diagnosis. So when a patient is cyanotic in, an out, in a nursery somewhere, you can make this diagnosis quickly uh, and, and uh, get going on what you have to do to, to try to um, ameliorate the cyanosis. It also helps us understand the orientation of the great arteries. Typically, the aorta is anterior and to the right, 
in transposition, but it can have a different orientations, which I'll show you in a moment. And these views can even help you um, get some hints about where the coronary arteries are located. I then show you this image to show you multiple different sub xiphoid planes, which really show the essence of the disease, which is that the great arteries come off from the heart in parallel um, rather than crossing each other as in patients with normally related great arteries. And you can see this in a variety of different ways. And, uh, and um, when you see this immediately, you should suspect that the patient has transposition. <clears throat> if you do start in the parasternal long axis, flu axis view, excuse me, uh, you'll see that instead of the uh, aorta arising from the left ventricle and taking a parallel orientation in this view, that the PA will dive and both great arteries will dive in parallel away from the heart. Um, and this is also a good view uh, to evaluate the left ventricular outflow tract, which is vulnerable to obstruction in patients with transposition. The four chamber view is remarkable for the fact that it looks relatively normal. And if you do a fetal echo and only do a four chamber view, you often will miss the diagnosis of transposition of the great arteries. So you can see the inflows here, the outflows will come, come around again. So here are the inflows. And as you see the outflows again, you'll see the pulmonary artery posterior and arising from the left ventricle, and then the aorta anterior arising from the right ventricle. You can assess semilunar valve function, the relationship of the aorta and the PA in this, uh, in this view, as well as ventricular performance. And again, some hints about potential abnormal coronary artery patterns. I mentioned that atrial uh, shunting is really the level of uh, providing the most effective pulmonary blood flow in this patient population. And so we can usually recognize quite quickly if the patient needs a balloon septostomy um, and that generally you don't even need echo to do that because you just have a pulse ox on the patient and that will tell you. However, the echo will quickly show you that the patient has a very restrictive ventricular uh, communication, I'm sorry, atrial communication. Uh, in this view on the right side, I just wanted to point your attention to this because you can be fooled in thinking that the patient has an atrial communication here, when in fact, the primary septum here is just being pushed uh, into the right atrium and there's no level of shunting at all in this, in this particular example. And so this leads us to needing a balloon atrial septostomy. And balloon atrial septostomies can of course be performed in the cath lab, but actually doing them in the, uh, echo, uh, in the ICU um, allows us to do it without any radiation. You don't have to move the patient from the intensive care unit. And it also shows us all the surrounding structures. You can see the balloon being pulled across the atrial septum on the view on your left. And uh, you, can, you can help guide the catheterization doctor with regard to whether the balloon is going across the mitral valve or trying to get into the left atrial appendage where it can injure structures. Uh, you usually cause a tear in the septum primum, as you can see in the middle screen. And then you often will have a satisfying increase in your pulse ox uh, when you have done uh, an appropriate balloon septostomy and then can confirm by echocardiography that you have adequate atrial level shunting. Ventricular septal defects are quite common in transposition, accounting for almost half of transposition. And you can have any type of ventricular septal defect in transposition that you can have in patients with a normal heart or normally related great arteries. So central perimembranous, outlet defects with or without malalignment, inlet defects, and muscular defects. And the malalignment defects add tremendous complexity to this disease because it will typically result in outflow tract obstruction. So we'll just go over some examples of VSDs in the setting of transposition. The central perimembranous VSD is probably the most common uh, other than muscular. Typically this VSD will sit right under the pulmonary valve and the flow direction will be the opposite of what you see in normally related great arteries. You'll see the flow going Toward, from the RV into the pulmonary artery. Um, I will tell you that these can be missed uh, when you do the echo right after birth. Now that we're making a lot of these diagnoses prenatally, 
many of these uh, infants are imaged within the first hour or two after uh, birth and their pulmonary vascular resistance is still high. So uh, you can miss uh, even large defects in that setting. And so it's always good uh, to look again uh, after a day or two to make sure that you uh, screen for uh, VSDs uh, that you may have not seen on the first sweep. The outlet VSD is when the infundibular septum or conal septum is small or absent. Typically, the aorta and pulmonary the aortic and pulmonary valves are in fibrous continuity, uh, and this is important for the surgeon to recognize because they may want to uh, approach this type of VSD through one of the outflows rather than uh, through the tricuspid valve. And importantly, because there is no conal septum. Uh, there's only fibrous tissue there, um, they may cause some damage to the semilunar valves in closing the VSD. So it is a very important defect to recognize in that setting. Posterior malalignment VSD uh, is when the conal septum or infundibular septum becomes an LV structure. The aorta tends to be directly anterior to the pulmonary artery in this setting. These patients typically cannot undergo an arterial switch operation uh, because the pulmonary outflow is small and that will become the neoaorta. So it's important to assess the VSD, the size of the VSD as well as its borders because you, typically the surgeon will be baffling the VSD to the aorta in a Rastelli type of procedure. Want to know about the severity of the pulmonary outflow tract obstruction and the size of the pulmonary annulus. Um, and what we're trying to do is determine if the patient is a candidate for a Rastelli uh, procedure or a Nikaido. Nikaido being where the aorta is moved closer to the LV in, in the hopes of preventing sub-aortic obstruction. So here you see the conal septum tipped into the left ventricle. You see that as well in this patient where the pulmonary outflow is quite small uh, and the aorta sits to the right. Anterior malalignment VSD, so this is sort of the opposite and is uh, uh, when what you see uh, in normally related great arteries is what you would see in Tetralogy of Fallot. The conal septum now becomes an RV structure. The aorta tends to be more side by side with the pulmonary artery. And these are the patients who undergo that very complex repair I mentioned earlier, arterial switch with VSD closure, and they may or may not need arch repair, and they may or may not need right ventricular outflow tract augmentation. And uh, so it's important to assess the size of the aortic outflow to determine if that needs to be repaired, as well as the aortic annulus, and always look at the arch in these patients because it's often obstructed. And here you'll see in the sub xiphoid sweep as you make your way up, there's the PA, and then you see the conal septum being an RV structure and the smallish aorta. And in this apical five chamber view, you see the malaligned conal septum here. Uh, the aorta is small, and this patient also has arch obstruction. And you can see the side-by-side -side, uh, nature of the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and that the pulmonary valve is sort of overriding the ventricular septum. Pulmonary outflow tract obstruction is relatively common in patients with transposition, a variety of different etiologies. And I show you two examples here, a subpulmonary ridge at the top. And here you see an abnormal mitral valve at cordal attachment to uh, the ventricular septum, which will impinge left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The diffuse hypertrophy that you see uh, in this figure is not as common anymore in patients because we operate on these patients so early, uh, but certainly the conal def deviate, septal deviation I just showed you in the example of posterior malalignment, and you can even have a uh, valvar pulmonary stenosis. And then we also pay attention on the echo to the alignment of the semilunar valve commissures. Typically the commissures align as you see in this high uh, parasternal view, but sometimes they're misaligned. Uh, and the surgeon uh, should know about this because it may affect their ability uh, to move the coronary arteries or translocate the coronary arteries without going over a commissure. So it's just important for them to know and the technical ability of moving the coronary arteries may be challenged uh, when you have this misalignment. And I just want to draw your attention to the variable great artery position that you can see in transposition. It can be in a, you can have a variety of different relationships. The most common being the aorta being anterior and to the right, as you see in this echo here in this example here. 
We will often see side-by-side -side great arteries in transposition, and you're more likely to have coronary artery variants when you have side-by-side -side great arteries. The aorta can be directly anterior to the pulmonary artery. In, in von Pragian terms, we would use the, ter the letter A in that situation. So if the aorta anterior to the right, we would use the letter D. If the aorta is anterior and to the left, as you see in this echo example, that's rarer uh, and is often associated with right ventricular hypoplasia, and we call that uh, SDL. And then very rarely, you can have a posterior aorta, exquisitely rare. <clears throat> Many of you are aware that there are very, uh, there's a number of coronary artery variants associated with transposition. And most of these can be readily diagnosed by echocardiography uh, these days. And we, in our comprehensive echo, we assess the coronary artery anatomy to try to help the surgeon be able to plan whether they'll be able to uh, do uh, an arterial switch operation. Essentially all coronary artery anatomy these days are switchable, but some are more challenging than others, and it's good for the surgeon to be able to be prepared in that setting. So uh, if you look at these, uh, the aorta and the PA in these figures, as this is the left-facing sinus and this is the right-facing sinus, the usual coronary arteries occur in about two-thirds of patients with the LAD and the CERC coming from the left-facing sinus and the right coming from the right-facing sinus. Circumflex from the right is the most common variation of this, uh, occurring about 10 to 15% of the time and occurs very commonly when the great arteries are side by side. And then you can have single left coronary artery or single right coronary artery. Uh, in both of these cases, the artery that's coming from the opposite sinus loops uh, around the great artery. You can have inverted coronary arteries or so-called double looping, uh, where the right comes from the left facing sinus and the left comes from the right facing sinus and the, great, and the coronaries have to loop around both great vessels, both anterior and posteriorly. And then you can have the dreaded intramural coronary, which fortunately only occurs about 5% of the time, but this is where you have a single coronary uh, and the, the, instead of the coronary looping around the great vessel, it goes between the two great arteries and often takes an intramural course within the wall of the aorta. This is very important for the surgeon to know because they may technically have to use a different strategy uh, to get the cor to translocate the coronary in this situation. And uh, past data has uh, suggested that this group of patients is at higher risk for poor outcome. So this is what the usual coronary anatomy looks like. You take a high parasternal view with some angulation coming down on both of the semilunar valves to see the right uh, coronary artery arising from the right facing sinus and the left giving rise to the LAD and CERC from the left facing sinus. And then I just wanted to provide this slide to you to give you some helpful hints that we use to determine abnormal coronary uh, ana ana um, anatomy. So if you see a coronary artery crossing posterior to the pulmonary artery, and this is seen best in the subxiphoid and apical views, and here's an example uh, in the apical view of a coronary crossing just behind the pulmonary artery, the differential for that is that you either have a circumflex from the right, you have a single right coronary, or you have an inverted left coronary artery. So those are the three things that you can have if you see a great uh, a coronary artery passing behind the pulmonary artery. If you see a uh, coronary crossing anterior to the aorta, as you see in this example of a single left coronary, you see the right arising here and going off to the right uh, over the aorta. Then you see the LAD and the CERC here. Uh, if you, you can see these in sub xiphoid view as well as high parasternal view. And the differential, if you see a coronary crossing anterior to the aorta, is you either have a single left coronary artery or you have an inverted right coronary artery. And then if you see the coronary crossing between the great arteries, and this is seen best in the high parasternal view, then you have an intramural coronary. And here's an anatomic example of an intramural coronary, as well as an echo demonstrating uh, a coronary cast 
crossing between the aorta and the pulmonary uh, artery in this uh, high parasternal view. Uh, the uh, aorta sits over the pulmonary artery because of that pulmonary, uh, because of that parallel uh, orientation. And so to view the ductus, uh, the best view to use is suprasternal sagittal rather than the high parasternal view used when your great arteries are normally related to each other. And I will say that um, because of this orientation and the duct inserting right where the isthmus is, it can be quite challenging to diagnose coarctation in the setting of transposition of the great arteries because the PDA is usually very, very large and can mask a coarctation. I'll briefly mention some variations of anatomy. Here's an example of a uh, uh, TGA with aorta to the left. And again, in von Pragian terms, we call this SDL. It's often a more complex form of transposition. Uh, here you see the PA uh, uh, anterior, and then you see the, a, uh, I'm sorry, the PA in posterior and the large aorta anterior and to the left. And you can see the orientation here. So there's the aorta. And then you'll see that the PA is to the right of it. It's often associated with tricuspid valve and right ventricular hypoplasia. And uh, because of the orientation of the aorta leftward of the PA, it can cause some stretching uh, of the coronary arteries during transfer. So it's just important to alert the surgeon if you have that uh, subtle uh, but important uh, variation. And then posterior aorta is exquisitely rare. Uh, usually there's subpulmonary conus only. And uh, if you look at these hearts, sorry, it's not playing. I apologize why it's not playing, but it often looks normal uh, from the outside of uh, the heart. Let's, I'll just try one more time to get it to play. Sorry, it's not going to, my apologies. In any case, no Lecompte is needed, needed in that situation. And then you can have tricuspid atresia in association with transposition of the great arteries. And you see that in the subxiphoid view here. You'll see the atrial communication here. There's absent uh, right, uh, right uh, communication between the RA and the RV. And uh, you'll see that the PA is arising from the left ventricle as we make our way through the sweep. Here's the PA arising from the left ventricle and the aorta arising from the right ventricle. And you see that also in this apical 14 review, which is also not working, my apologies. Um, the aortic size is related to VSD size. Typically these patients have aortic uh, arch obstruction and often they will have juxtaposition of the atrial appendages, so look out for that. These patients typically require a Norwood procedure rarely um, um, a pulmonary artery band if the VSD and the aorta are, are of good size. And typically this will culminate in Fontan operation. And then juxtaposition of the uh, atrial appendage, left juxtaposition uh, is important to diagnose in this patient population because it can be confused with an atrial septal defect. Um, here you see in this sweep, uh, you'll see that the orientation of the atrial septum is perpendicular to the diaphragm rather than parallel. And that is your first hint that a patient may have juxtaposition. You'll then see the juxtaposed right atrial appendage making its way over. You'll see to and fro flow within that, which should also give you the hint that it is not an atrial communication. So there's the atrial communication. Here's the juxtaposed atrial appendage going with flow going back and forth, sitting on top of the left uh, um, uh, atrial appendage. So why do we have uh, do surgery in patients who have transposition of the great arteries? Well, the natural history is dismal. And this is a paper uh, from the British Heart Journal uh, looking at this patient population in the late 1960s. Over 50% died within the first month, uh, almost 90% died within the first year. And you can look at the rate of death uh, compared to years, how, how young these patients die compared to many other lesions such as tetralogy of Fallot, ventricular septal defect, coarctation. Patients with ventricular septal defects tended to live longer and the cause of death early was severe cyanosis, so inadequate uh, um, um, mixing and late was uh, a pulmonary vascular disease. <clears throat> 
I'm gonna talk about some post-operative imaging now. Hopefully my clips will work. And this is just a timeline of treatment options that became available to us uh, over the course of time. So the first description of this disease uh, was in 1797. And then Blaylock Hanlon do, did uh, beating heart atrial septectomies in the late 40s. And then the landmark work of Senning and Mustard uh, with the atrial switch operation because arterial switches had been attempted at that time but failed because uh, they could not translocate the coronary arteries primarily. So the late 50s, early 60s, we started the era of um, surgery for patients with transposition where they had atrial switches. Uh, Dr. William Rashkin from my own institution, uh, it, who's considered the father of pediatric uh, interventional cardiology, uh, described uh, using a balloon to uh, perform an atrial septostomy, uh, first described by him and Miller in 1966. And this allowed patients to sort of have a for relatively stable course until they were able to have the atrial switch operation. And then land work, a work done by Dr. Rostelli at the Mayo Clinic uh, figured out a way to perform surgery on patients with TGA VSDPS by, by baffling the VSD to the aorta and forming a communication between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And then finally, uh, Dr. Jaten in Brazil was the first to describe a successful arterial switch operation, which changed the way we cared for patients with transposition of the great arteries. So the atrial switch was the first successful method to uh, surgically palliate these patients and altered the blood flow pattern so that it was in series by baffling the atria. The coronary arteries did not have to be moved. The superior and inferior vena cava were baffled to the mitral valve. The pulmonary veins uh, baffled around to the tricuspid valve. The RV served as, as the systemic ventricle and the tricuspid valve served at, as the systemic uh, atrioventricular valve. So when you're, if you happen to still be doing atrial switches of any kind, and the most common scenario to do them now is when we're doing double switches in patients with congenitally corrected transposition. This is the intraoperative checklist you need. You need to uh, try to assess the superior and inferior limbs of the systemic venous baffle for obstruction or baffle leaks, the pulmonary venous baffle for obstruction, to assess biventricular function and the function of the systemic AV valve. And again, I draw your attention to this checklist that's provided in our guideline of the views that you need to use uh, by transthoracic imaging in the postoperative patient, the structures that you're identifying and what we're looking for. Here is a TEE uh, in the superior limb of a patient uh, who uh, has uh, had an atrial switch operation. Um, and you can see uh, this is a balloon going through the atrial communication here uh, to try to enlarge the uh, SVC limb. Um, often uh, these patients require pacing wires uh, and that takes up space within the superior limb which is already vulnerable uh, to obstruction. The IVC limb tends to not get obstructed. Oh, I'm... Sorry to tell you that my clips are not working. Um, so this is uh, the systemic venous channel in the apical, uh, in the, uh, apical uh, view, the uh, TEE four chamber view. And then in uh, apical view, you can see the systemic venous baffle is unobstructed. And this one is, uh, is obstructed, but unfortunately uh, I'll have to try to figure out a way to get these uh, images to you so that you can see them uh, moving. Uh, as I said, obstruction is most common in the SVC limb. Uh, baffle leaks typically occur near the IVC limb, and you can use uh, contrast injections to try to uh, determine that. And then uh, we look to see if there is obstruction at the pulmonary venous channel as well. Um, it's hard for you to see in the still frame, but this is a completely unobstructed pulmonary venous channel. And you can at least see in this still frame that the uh, pulmonary venous channel, which comes around the systemic venous channel, which is right here, is very obstructed in this patient. Uh, and you can even do 3D imaging to look at that baffle pathway. Pulmonary venous baffle obstruction is a very serious problem that can cause pulmonary hypertension and death and generally requires surgical revision. The arterial switch uh, first performed successfully again by Dr. Jatine uh, 
transection of both great arteries, switching of the vessels, coronary artery reimplantation, and then the Lecompte maneuver where the aorta is tucked behind both great arteries is used to uh, address the, the branch pulmonary artery position to prevent narrowing, particularly of the left pulmonary artery. And uh, here is your intraoperative checklist for the arterial switch. Uh, the surgeon is making a transection of both great arteries. So you need to look at both of these suture lines to determine if there's supravalvar aortic or pulmonary stenosis. You want to very carefully assess ventricular performance to look for regional wall motion abnormalities because the surgeon has moved the coronary arteries from the aorta to the neo-aorta. And you wanna make sure that the coronary arteries are not kinked or twisted in any way. You also wanna look at the left ventricular outflow tract because it's vulnerable to obstruction as well as any semilunar valve regurgitation that may have occurred with the uh, switch of the great arteries. And uh, this is an epicardial view, which is also not going to play, uh, which shows um, the Lecompte draped over the great arteries. And here are the, uh, pom the uh, coronary arteries uh, now arising from the neo-aorta, and you can perform Doppler in the coronary arteries, particularly with epicardial, to help you assess whether there is obstruction of the coronary arteries or not. Certainly, if you see dysfunction of the left ventricle, particularly regional wall motion abnormalities, then that should alert you that you should be looking for coronary kinking. And this was a paper put out uh, from Toronto Sick Kids a number of years ago, looking at coronary Doppler patterns after the arterial switch. Here you see normal low velocity in diastole uh, in the right and left coronary artery. And here you see examples of obstruction with some retrograde flow and a higher velocity flow here. And then after revision, you can see that the, the Doppler uh, pattern changes to a more normal pattern. And here's your arterial switch, again, checklist postoperatively with your views, the structures we're looking at, and what we're looking for. And again, that's in the guideline. And then the arterial switch operation, you can in your subcostal sweep essentially see the entire surgery and get a very good sense of whether it, it's been a good arterial switch or not. Here you see both great arteries arising. Here's the neo aorta. Atrial septum is now intact. You can see the suture line of the aorta, the suture line of the pulmonary. You can see the left pulmonary artery draped over the aorta because of the Lecompte maneuver. You can see that the ventricular performance looks relatively good and you don't see uh, any significant neo-aortic or neo-pulmonary regurgitation. And you can also look for uh, AV valve regurgitation. Here are two still frames showing you supravalvar narrowing of the pulmonary at the level of the suture line and some narrowing uh, of the supravalvar uh, area of the aorta after the arterial switch. Uh, if you see um, regional wall motion abnormalities after the arterial switch, always assume it's a coronary artery problem and you have to prove otherwise. And often that requires modalities other than echocardiography. You cannot rely on court echocardiography to, to assure you that the coronaries are okay. So you may require CT scan or even angiography when you're concerned because time is of the essence and uh, the coronary may need to be addressed. And high parasternal view is a really good view in transthoracic echo to see the pulmonary arteries draped over the aorta. This is something you will never see in the natural state. You only see both pulmonary arteries draped over the aorta in somebody who's had the Lecompte maneuver. And just uh, to recognize that some patients after the arterial switch, their pulmonary vascular resistance never drops uh, and they can have pulmonary hypertension um, and it can occur early or late in this patient population. And in some cases, it may be related to a aortopulmonary collateral burden um, and pulmonary vasodilators may be used in this situation, but obviously this carries a relatively poor prognosis. And then late uh, concerns after the arterial switch, other than the coronary arteries and the branch pulmonary arteries, are the development of neo-aortic root dilation and valve regurgitation. And this is the most common long-term complication. And thus far, uh, fortunately, aortic replace, root replacement has been relatively uncommon. But as this population ages, ages and these roots dilate, 
and they develop more severe regurgitation, it's likely that we will see patients requiring reoperation for this uh, as time goes on. Dr. Ristelli, uh, who unfortunately died quite young, uh, developed this operation for, uh, uh, that's named for him uh, for TGA with posterior malalignment VSD in patients who could not undergo an atrial switch or um, arterial switch. Uh, the patient um, uh, had a baffle from the VSD to the aorta, uh, which is sitting over the left ventricle, and then a connection is made between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, which is typically a conduit. And so your intraoperative checklist includes assessment of the LV2 aortic pathway. This can become small right after surgery, uh, especially if the VSD is a bit, bit small to begin with, or is something that can definitely progress over time. You wanna make sure that the conduit or RV to PA pathway is unobstructed. It's important to look for residual VSDs, particularly intramural VSDs, as well as biventricular function and AV valve regurgitation. And these are not gonna play either, but you can at least see uh, that the, uh, in this orientation, uh, you see um, left atrium, left ventricle, and you can see a, uh, here's the VSD patch, and you can see an unobstructed pathway from the LV to the aorta. In contrast, here you see a patient who has muscle around the VSD, which is forming the outflow tract, uh, and it is quite narrowed. You can even see the jet of uh, narrowing that occurs here. And this is our standard protocol for postoperative uh, transthoracic echo for the Ristelli. Again, same orientation. And just to point out that the sub, uh, the sub uh, uh, pulmonary conus, the conal septum, can uh, form a muscular ring in the VSD that causes this significant obstruction. And so often this VSD uh, has to be enlarged. And here you're looking down at a patient who has uh, the aortic valve open and down below you see that muscular ring of obstruction in a patient who had this uh, obstruction uh, during surgery. Residual VSD may also occur. Uh, and it's important to recognize that um, uh, intramural defects may occur. And that's when the patch, the VSD patch, instead of being attached to the aortic annulus, is actually attached to the free wall of the right ventricle. What happens is it may be attached to, to sort of muscle bundles rather than the wall itself. And those muscle bundles pull away from the RV free wall and channels develop between the left ventricular outflow tract and the RV. And these can enlarge over time and get very, very complex. You can see uh, this sort of waterfall VSD around the VSD patch in this trans, uh, esophageal echo, and in this transthoracic echo, you can sort of really see the extreme complexity that this VSD uh, uh, has. And it can be quite difficult for the surgeon to visualize these VSDs from the RV side. And it's highly associated with morbidity and mortality. We did a study here a number of years ago with one of our fellows, which uh, clearly showed that these patients did far worse than the patients who did not have an intramural VSD. Uh, and uh, often it will require reoperation. So it's just something to keep in mind. So I apologize that some of my clips didn't work, but hopefully you got the idea that transposition a diagnosis by echo prior to surgery uh, really, uh, and uh, we can make the entire diagnosis by echocardiography. And it is very rare to require additional imaging uh, prior to surgery. And uh, I hope I showed you that anatomy really determines surgical strategy. The surgical procedures we reviewed all have different short and long-term complications. So be cognizant of these variations. Uh, for example, in arterial switch, uh, we're gonna be looking for supravalvar narrowing. We're gonna be looking at the coronary arteries. We're gonna be looking for regional wall motion abnormalities. After the atrial switch, we're gonna look at the limb pathways, the the um, uh, superior and inferior limbs of the systemic venous baffle, the pulmonary venous baffle, uh, the function of the RV and the tricuspid valve, which are now the systemic ventricle. And then in the Restelli, the pathway from the left ventricle to the aorta is essential, the RV to PA conduit. Um, so really all the different surgeries 
require us to look at very different things. And then multimodality imaging, which I didn't touch upon, but is important, is, is what we will use often to follow these patients as they go into adulthood. And that can be an entire uh, other discussion, but is definitely covered in our multimodality guideline. So thank you for your time. And again, I apologize for any um, obstacles we had with uh, the imaging. Thank you, Mary. It was very good. Even for me that uh, I'm not an echocardiographist, it was amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. This is one talk that is really worth uh, taking a look uh, again. I'm so sorry. I need to ask first uh, Norman to give his comments and then I will ask him to chair the discussion because my battery just died and uh, so I lost all the q and I, I cannot see them anymore. So uh, Norma, if you could do that, please give your comments that are always awesome and then uh, lead the discussion, please. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for all of the technical problems, yeah. but that's uh, part for the course. We have to uh, endure them. And Meryl, that was great. Um, I don't have a whole lot of comments to make because I think you articulated it very well. There are a few issues that I think are worthwhile bringing out to people who are not really Van Pragians mm -hmm. about D loop and L loop. And when we talk about transposition, we don't do what Dr. Van Prague said, because when he talked about transposition, the first part of his sets is to say transposition SDD or That's SLL right. or ILL or whatever. And That's what right. people do is they forget the transposition and then they just use the segments. And then they make the mistake with the segments of thinking that the D refers to the position of the great vessels. Right. But the D refers to the segmental uh, alignment of the, of the ventricles. That's so correct. So D is a D loop ventricle and correct. L is an L loop ventricle. Correct. And I think that's why there's a lot of confusion and yes. problems. It's not Dr. Van Prague who was the problem. It's us who <laughs> tend to be slovenly in our uh, presentation of his information. And I think that's important for the, uh, the 167 people who are listening to this. I totally agree. Uh, it, it is meant to be used for the looping. Um, and you know, there's problems with that as well because you can be L-looped and have the physiology of transposition of the great arteries if you have mirror image or situs inversus, right? So yeah, yeah. it's extremely important to just describe everything as you see, which is the Andersoni approach as well, right? So if you say, so you can't just say the letters because the letters can mean a variety of different things. If you say SDD, you can be SDD with transposition or with double outlet, or uh, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, can have, you can have mitral atresia with SDD. So um, what I would say is, what we're, what we're directing ourselves towards these days is using the term transposition when we meet transposition of the great arteries and then talking about the letters when we're talking about atrioventricular concordance, ventricular arterial discordance. And we're using the term congenitally corrected transposition when we're talking about atrioventricular discordance with ventricular arterial discordance. So that way it doesn't matter what the looping is it doesn't matter what, what the orientation of the great arteries is. One is the physiology of transposition and one is the physiology of corrected transposition. I think that that can help get rid of some of this uh, ambiguity. Well, or, I, I think that's, that's true. Right? You've just opened up another can of worms. Uh-oh. <laughs> because the can of worms is, can you talk about a condition where there's transposition and double outlet right ventricle together? And certainly if you're a Van Pragian, a purist, you cannot talk about transposition and double outlet in the same breath. That's correct. And yet what we have is a problem of a condition where there is a ventricular septal defect with a sub uh, pulmonary VSD and whether there is really continuity, mitral aortic continuity or not. And I don't want to get into the Andersonian Van Pragian issue. I don't see it as much of a problem to me. It's the same condition and the treatment is identical. Right. So it isn't a big problem for me, whether it's a double outlet uh, with a subpalmary VSD 
or transposition with the VSD, uh, I think that they may be difficult to determine in their purity, but it's very easy practically to uh, uh, recognize what you're dealing with and to treat them appropriately. So the one thing I would say about that, Norman, is, um, and this doesn't apply to all situations. However, when you typically in transposition, you in the pure form of transposition, you have sub aortic infundibulum only, and there's mitral to pulmonary continuity. So if the pulmonary artery is sitting over the VSD, the roof of the VSD is the semilunar valve. And so if you baffle the VSD to the PA and do an arterial switch, then it's very unlikely that patient will develop subaortic obstruction because there's no circle of muscle that prevents the blood from getting out to the, to the new aorta, the neo aorta. In contrast, if you have a Tausig Bing like you know, DORV, which has transposition physiology, subpulmonary VSD, which you're talking about, those patients we know have subpulmonary and subaortic infundibulum, so bilateral infundibulum. So now when you're baffling the VSD to the neo aorta and doing the arterial switch, you have a ring of muscle uh, where the LV is getting to the, uh, the neo aorta and those patients are at risk for sub AS. So that to me is the most important reason for the distinction. Yeah, and of course uh, you need to have a big rim of muscle which is easy to recognize. So. Yes. I think that's important. There's yes. one other issue here in your talk, which you brilliantly shied away from. <laughs> which that is? is to how do you call the coronary arteries? You call them the left facing sinus yes. and the right facing sinus. And I am actually on your side as much <laughs> as Dr. Anderson would want to hit me over the head about this. <laughs> but the problem is with this Leiden convention. Yes, it is. It's really a, a big problem. <laughs> it's a brilliant shorthand. And I, I brought this matter up to Bob Anderson because, uh, you know, normally when you stand in the aortic route as a surgeon and you look, the sinus number one is to your right hand. Okay, that's perfectly correct. So you can say one uh, left and two, uh, right. circumflex and left anterior descending, and you can get a beautiful description which can be statistically manipulated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our problem, of course, is that we don't stand in the sinus of Alsalva. We stand in the outflow tract of the ventricle. Exactly. So then it's the left <laughs> hand. That's the sinus number one. That's so right. I find the sinus thing a really confusing, but I think that for the people that are listening to this meeting, it's easy to understand the differences because uh, it just depends on how you define the sinus number one. If you're a surgeon, it's to your right hand. If you're an echocardiographer, it's to your left, left hand. hand. Right. That's so exactly I think right. that, that, that takes care of it. And for me, I'm easily able to call in the left facing sinus or the right facing sinus and get away with that. So I think that you did avoid that. And I think that it's important because the people that listen to this, that know about these things, and then they can't resolve how we deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think practically as echocardiographers, we deal with it very, very reasonably. And we can communicate that to the surgeons very, very reasonably. And I only wanted to make one other point that you made so beautifully, and that's the risk with coronary anatomy of the uh, intramural course of the coronary and the malalignment of the uh, coronary cusps mm -hmm. is a good pointer. It's not always the case, but it's a good pointer to the presence of an intramural coronary. And of course, that's something you don't want to miss. So right. from that point of view, I'd have to congratulate you on, on a really wonderful talk and in order to fulfill the um, questions and answers section, I'll go and um, uh, try and ask the questions and you can answer them uh, for me from the uh, question and answer section. Omar al asked, what is the most reliable echo finding that indicate left ventricular deconditioning in transposition? And what is the best way of reconditioning? Yeah, that's, that's a, a tough question. That's a tough question, yes. 
um, you know, we, I have to say in the United States, we don't see deconditioning too much because I think the average day that we do an arterial switch in these patients is probably day three to five of life. So it, it isn't something that comes up very often. So often it's patients who are coming from other places where we see this. Um, I don't think L, I don't think echo is a very reliable way to measure LV mass um, to determine if the LV is deconditioned or not. And so if we are worried about the LV um, in this situation, then we will often do a cardiac MRI. And I know that's not available to everybody. <clears throat> um, so the, you know, what you would try to do in this situation is a, a pulmonary artery band. And this is often done, obviously, in congenitally corrected transposition when potentially anticipating for a double switch operation. Um, and then by echo, you would have to just very carefully try to measure the wall thickness um, that you have to try to get a sense of if you've gotten to a place where you think it's appropriate to be able to do the procedure. I think probably uh, because we're not particularly great at this, that cathing those patients to make sure their LV is at systemic pressure uh, would be worthwhile before trying to do an art a late arterial switch. I don't know what you think, Norman. No, I think that uh, that's true. Uh, it's a tough, tough question. And that the answer is all equally tough. And what I've been surprised about with the surgeons who uh, uh, are really um, kind of very courageous people is that even if the pressure is dropped in the ventricle uh, in, in, in a month or so, they'll still go ahead and do an arterial switch and get away with it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when it, the patients are older, it's a, it's, a, it's a much more difficult question. Yeah. yeah. So let's just leave it at that. And then Riam Abasi asked, he said, this is a nice schedule. What is the name of the book? I don't know with which book he's talking about, but uh, you named Merton's book in... Uh, which oh, well, is we, well, we have a new, you know, our third edition of our Echo textbook just came out, which has a beautiful transposition chapter in it that I helped write with Dr. Mertens. Uh, it's called Echocardiography in Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease, and I'll plug it. It's, uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, and the multimodality guideline, um, I actually sent to Grace and Sasha. And so hopefully you guys can have copies of that if you, sure. if you would like that. All right, that's taken care of that. And then here's a tough question from our good friend, Jason Tan. Jason is a constant uh, reviewer of our uh, sessions on the Congenital Heart Academy. I don't know where Jason's from, but he said, why do patients develop collateral vessels? So this is another tough question. I mean, we've got a very, very sophisticated audience this morning. Yes, uh, I can't profess to say that I know why they de develop collaterals. We know, we, we surmise that patients develop collaterals because of cyanosis. Um, and certainly that seems to be the case in the single ventricle population, the Glenn and Fontan patients who, do, who, who often develop a fairly large aortopulmonary collateral burden. Um, and we, we assume that that's why patients with transposition have collaterals, but I don't think we know the answer. And there's tremendous variation uh, yeah. in whether people have them. But certainly what I would say is if you have a patient who you've done an arterial switch on uh, and, their, and their PVR does not drop, uh, they have uh, super systemic RV pressure um, as, First, make sure that there are no anatomic abnormalities such as significant supravalvar pulmonary stenosis because that's a fixable problem. And then likely those patients need to have cat catheterization to look for aortic pulmonary collaterals because sometimes our cath colleagues can coil those and that can have an effect and, and decrease their pulmonary vascular resistance to some degree. I don't know the answer, but I would submit that the answer is uh, not uh, something from after birth, but something that happens before, before birth. birth yeah. And if you look at the transposition physiology in the fetus, the amount of oxygen going to the lung is much higher. And right. therefore, there is a different physiology, which includes these uh, collateral vessels, which are a natural phenomenon. Eventually, That's perhaps they go to become bronchial collaterals eventually. Yeah. But in transposition, the whole physiology in the lung is different. The flow is, is increased into the lung. 
Uh, in the last trimester of pregnancy, the vascular resistance drops, and these vessels are there in, yeah. in all of us. It's just how they develop, and I think that the answer is, is that way inclined, and I think that it doesn't make any difference when you've got it, you have problems. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Rudolph reminded me that if you take a pulmonary artery sample, wedge sample, in a patient with transposition in the cat lab, and you suck and you get a high saturation, it's probably because there are bronchial collaterals present. Oh, and so we know that there's a problem. Uh, we know how to treat it, and perhaps we can do better. So now I've got uh, Mohammed Ab Abdullahi, Abdullahi, who's asked two questions. The <clears> first <throat> concerns posterior transposition, which is rare. I have only seen two cases in my career of uh, over 40 years of echocardiography and cardiology. And um, some people have determined this a variant of double outlet. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I'm going to let you handle it. I think that tra posterior transposition is posterior transposition. And I think uh, Bob Anderson has used that because what we talk about in transposition is really a relationship of the, or the connection of the vessels rather than simply their relationship. Again, talking about physiology rather than just pure anatomy. And posterior transposition is uh, a certainly an entity. I have it in, in my chapter that I've given here in the Congenital Heart Academy as well. But I leave it to you, Meryl, to uh, put the final icing on this one. Yeah, I, I, as you said, it's exquisitely rare. And in fact, I think part of the reason why those clips didn't work was because uh, I borrowed them from someone because I personally have never seen it uh, in my practice of 25 something years. So um, I think I, I called you for my chapter to ask you if you'd. Yes, one. yes, yeah. I, think you I did. found one, a beautiful one, which has been published by uh, Shane Elaine Morris, our, my other wonderful resource for uh, uh, rare uh, images. And yeah. this is definitely transposition. And when you scan it subcostally, the aorta is coming from the right ventricle posterior. The aorta is coming from the left ventricle. Uh, the pulmonary artery is coming from the left ventricle. But there is also a ventricular septal defect. Yes. And that's the other issue in this condition. There is usually a ventricular septal defect. Yes, there defect. is. Right. Right. That's okay. right. Now, Mohammed has another question, which um, I'm going to let you handle. And maybe I'll chime in a little bit. Is, is there any technical trick to making visualization of the coronary arteries easier as it is usually covered with the lungs? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I would say is, and what I tried to point out in, in, in the talk is that, you know, people tend to go to the high parasternal view to look at the coronary arteries uh, as they arise from the aorta, but you can actually use all your other views to give you a lot of hints about coronary orientation. And so I use every sweep I have. I can tell somebody has a circ from the right in about one second in the first sweep that patients are doing because you see a coronary passing behind the pulmonary artery. And if you're gonna use a guess, the chances are that that patient has a circ from the right. They can have single coronary, as I told you about the differential there, but you at least know there is an abnormal coronary from the get-go. And so trying to find that in the high parasternal view uh, can sometimes be challenging, as you said, because of the lungs. What you just have to do, I think, sort of physically is like move your, your, your um, probe around and try to just get the window, the best window you can. And then you angulate towards each AV groove uh, to try to see each of the coronary arteries. The subcostal or sub xiphoid and apical views one of the thing I would just sort of shout out is that you should really do complete sweeps, you know, from off the heart all the way anterior till you're off the heart, because the, if you have an anterior looping coronary, it's the last thing you'll see uh, as you sweep off the aorta. And some people don't go that far uh, in, their, in their sweep and they might miss it. So you can use a variety of tricks of the trade to help you um, um, and, and all your views. Um, to, to, search, to try to get a sense of what the coronary arteries are. Well, I, I endorse everything that you've said, Meryl. I think that you have to also 
try and orient your probe in a different way. So don't just use conventional probe, uh, plane, mm -hmm. planes, but turn the probe backwards and forwards. I, I endorse also the fact that um, the heart is covered by lungs, but the subcostal area has right. only a tendon of the diaphragm, which is really easily transmissible. So subcostal imaging sometimes will give you images that you don't see normally in other views. And the other thing that I found useful is sometimes changing the kind of transducer that you use and changing the frequency. Please pay attention to the fact that today's transducers allow us to change frequency of uh, how we receive the, uh, the ultrasound images uh, by harmonics and other ways. And I think that this is another issue that is, is helpful, Mohammed. I hope this is useful for you. Now, we have another Mohammed, Mohammed Abbas, and most patients had stretching of both PA branches on regular follow-up. So are there any recommendations to ask for regular CT angio to delineate them regularly? Uh, so, I, so yes, yeah, sometimes the branch PAs are difficult to see by echo, particularly the left pulmonary artery. But again, that high parasternal view where you come down on the Lecompte uh, often will, will allow you to see them. You can use secondary indications of if you're concerned about the branch pulmonary arteries, such as uh, RV pressure estimate. And if so, if you don't have supravalvar pulmonary outflow tract obstruction, which you should be able to see pretty easily, uh, but you have elevated RV pressure in the setting of an arterial switch, uh, then you should be potentially suspicious that there is significant branch pulmonary artery stenosis. And so that may be a setting where you wanna use multimodality or cross-sectional imaging, either CT or MR uh, to help you, uh, you know, figure out if there's a narrowing that needs to be addressed. So the RV pressure can be a hint uh, to that. Um, uh, and uh, again, you can use your other sweeps, your sub xiphoid sweep, as I, as I showed when I showed the arterial switch, you can often see the LPA going across to get a sense of if it's narrowed or not. You can't Doppler in that view because you're perpendicular to the color, but uh, in general, those are some of the tips that you would use. Sure. Look, I've got a lot of questions here. Many <laughs> of them seem to be, uh, I, I think, for editorial was I, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Yeah. Uh, so um, the, the, the next question also is maybe a little bit from Miguel Angel Arispana, who says, uh, how should we uh, be given to the mass of the left ventricle for viability as a systemic ventricle? Okay. And the, the, you, you, this is a, a, a tough, complex question, yeah. but I'm sure that you're going to give us a brilliant answer. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Norman. <laughs> um, I think this is tough. I, I, uh, you know, we tend to use. Uh, I think. I think other modalities such as three um, D imaging and strain will come into play uh, uh, as we become more facile and familiar with those strategies uh, in helping us make this determination. I do think. As of right now, we're still using um, MRI to help us with this, um, to, to really determine mass and Z-scores of mass to, to know if we've gotten to the hypertrophy that we need. Um, putting a PA band on a patient with a late diagnosis or late, you know, sort of late determination for arterial switch is risky business. And um, even if you think you have adequate LV mass, we're not always correct. And the LV can fall apart uh, when we try to do an arterial switch. So um, uh, it, I don't think there is a really clean answer to this problem. It would be really great to cohort these patients uh, in a way in a database of some kind, since uh, they happen all over the world to try to get a sense of what seems to work and what doesn't seem to work because I think everybody has a few examples and uh, similar to congenitally corrected transposition where we don't always know what to do. Um, we don't know what to do always or whether the LV is ever really adequately ready in this situation. I, I, I don't think I can answer the question completely. Well, I mean, I, I did try and do this when I was working at Stanford with uh, Frank Hanley and uh, 
what uh, they do for their double switches is they do vent um, ventricular mass calculated by MRI, right. which is uh, certainly a really relatively absolute uh, yes. way of doing it. And when the left ventricular mass reaches a certain volume, uh, 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 value, not volume, then uh, they think of going for um, a double switch. Right. I think also, I mean, a simple way of looking at it, although I was unable to um, substantiate this because of lack of data, was the left ventricle thickens. And you can see the left ventricle thickening uh, on an M mode very, very beautifully. Uh, you know, you can see how much percentage thickening you get of the left ventricle. If that left ventricle doesn't thicken, I think that it's a really a hazard to mm -hmm. go and do an arterial. Uh, so back to good old M mode. Yeah, the good old M mode that nobody wants to know about. But I still I mean, love M mode too. So I'm with you on the M mode. Yeah, I think that that's that's certainly a, a, an additional help. The other thing also that I found is that the septum also has to thicken. Yes. And you know there is often in uh, these uh, switch candidates there is fibrosis that develops within the ventricle. And if the septum doesn't thicken, then I think you also have a hazard. Yeah. Uh, that this information is still, I think, subject to uh, further evaluation and probably best done on a multi-institutional basis, you know, as a, as a research uh, complex. But and then somebody asked about, somebody asked about whether, how you determine whether you do a Rastelli or a Nakaido which I think is a great question. Yeah. Um, and uh, just before you do that, would you yeah. explain the Nakaido procedure? Because sure. I think a lot of people don't understand what the Nakaido is. Sure, I don't have pictures to show you, but the Nakaido procedure is done uh, in cases, since we know in the Restelli that sub aortic obstruction can occur. And I showed you some examples of that because the aorta is sitting entirely over the right ventricle and you're making a pathway and often there's muscle in the way from your LV pathway to your aorta. And so in order to try to mitigate that LV outflow tract obstruction, uh, the surgeons can sometimes um, move the aorta closer to the left ventricle. That's really what the Nakaido is doing. So they take out the aorta, they transect through the pulmonary annulus and open up the pulmonary outflow tract since you're not gonna use it anymore. And they move the aorta closer over the left ventricle. Sometimes they have to reimplant the coronaries if they're sitting in a funny position, sometimes not. And then they baffle the VSD to where the new aorta is sitting. And uh, if you look at side-by-side -side images of somebody who's had a Restelli and a Nakaido, the profile of the pathway from the left ventricle to the aorta in the Nakaido is much more normally oriented because you're, the aorta is closer to the LV. And theoretically, those patients are less likely to develop subaortic obstruction. So that's the reason to do it. Um, and the patients who seem to be good candidates for that are ones where um, it, sometimes it depends on the size of the pulmonary outflow tract itself. Um, if, if the pulmonary outflow tract is very, very small or pulmonary atresia, the aorta is all, seems to be already close enough to the left ventricle that you may not need to do a Nakaido. If the pulmonary outflow is larger, then the aorta is further over the right ventricle. And so those patients might be a good candidate. And finally, there are patients who have malalignment VSDs that are small. And so the pathway from the LV to the aorta is small uh, because the VSD itself is small. And so the surgeons may decide to do a Nakaido in that situation rather than try to enlarge the VSD uh, and potentially cause heart block and other things. I don't know what you're, if I explain that adequately. Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a hard operation to understand. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a, but it, I think the, the interesting thing is that the results of Nakaido are sometimes much better than a Restelli operation. Yeah. The Restelli operation in transposition, I think, uh, is, is moving away from uh, its position of prominence. Yeah. So let me just ask this last question. Let's make this the last one. Okay. Uh, and, and this one is, um, you can handle uh, uh, with authority. 
if after balloon septostomy, there is no, this is by Adel Kamal, uh, there, uh, there, there's no great benefit in terms of oxygen saturation. Okay. What about stenting the ductus, if there is a ductus? Right. So typically we find that the ductus is not the problem when the mixing is poor. Um, so stenting the ductus doesn't really change the mixing in that situation. So patients who undergo balloon septostomy and don't have an improvement in their oxygenation um, are often the patients who um, are at risk for pulmonary vascular disease. Um, what we have decided to do in that scenario sometimes is we will put the patient on ECMO support if they're really blue to try to just at least protect their brain. And then we will take them on ECMO to do, go do their arterial switch in the hopes that by doing this, the operation, the pulmonary vascular resistance will drop and they will improve. Um, and we've seen that happen a number of times. So the ductus itself is not really uh, gonna help with the mixing typically in that situation. It may even hurt with the mixing, if particularly if your atrial communication is small, but um, we tend to stabilize them either by taking them right to the operating room and doing the arterial switch or stabilizing them on uh, uh, ECMO support prior to, and then doing the switch off the off ECMO. Um, so that, that's how we approach that problem. Can I make one what comment? Are, sure, of course. <laughs> so uh, uh, going back to that question about uh, how to assess the mass of the LV and say if the patient is ready or not uh, for uh, their arterial switch. Uh, there was a nice paper, uh, I think from 2020, if I'm not mistaken. So the, a group from, from Italy, they decided to do their arterial switch with a uh, uh, Patients that were uh, sent to them after one month of age, so all of them with banana shape, uh, array of shape, low mass, and all of that, and they found that the mortality was not higher. They only required more ECMO. Uh, now that you, you 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 said something about ECMO, I remember about that paper. So mm -hmm. maybe all our efforts to evaluate the LV mass, maybe we don't need that. Maybe we could be a little bit more liberal to do arterial switch in the patients with late right. presentation and just uh, understand that they are going to give more trouble on the ICU, maybe require more ECMO, but it's feasible. Yeah, I would say that um, if, they have a, if they have a large duct and they're a month of age, they, they may still be okay. Um, you know, so that, so may, I, it would be interesting to know if those patients had systemic LV pressure at the time. Uh, I think a lot of the patients who wind up getting in trouble are probably a bit older than that. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I wanted to ask you, Grace, while you were here. I didn't. I didn't hear what she, I didn't catch what she said. Okay, no, I just said that uh, if I uh, remember well, that paper, uh, the LV was already banana shape in most of the patients, so we didn't have a systemic uh, pressure on on the on the okay. LV. Well, that's great. What about the use of uh, of nitric oxide? I mean, I'm sure that these are. These patients are all have pulmonary hypertension. And I mean, the, the question is, how do you get by with a hypertension? Are you using nitric oxide and other vasodilators before you go to ECMO? Or is, is, uh, is, is it a straight ECMO? Uh, I am a little out of my expertise uh, in, in this discussion, well, honestly. We've got Grace here. Grace, this yeah, is Grace can, Grace can talk about it. I, I, you know, I'm not an ICU doctor, so I don't want to step on anybody's toes. <laughs> Uh, because it depends why the patient is uh, moving forward uh, to go on ECMO. If it's LV dysfunction post-op, usually nitric doesn't help. S sometimes they have pulmonary hypertension for sure, and they are very unsaturated on the post-op. And then for that, the nitric uh, would help. Okay. So the, the other thing about it is that um, the uh, in utero milieu, of pulmonary of, of, uh, of transposition uh, affects the um, development of the pulmonary vasculature in the lung because uh, the amount of oxygen that's coming into the lung in transposition is much higher than normal 
-hmm. there's vasodilatation, there's more development, and there's also more muscle. Okay, so all of this leads to the presence of pulmonary hypertension. And I think uh, with the tincture of time, you know, uh, a lot of this uh, can resolve itself. So I think uh, it's not that as unfavorable as it might seem. All right. Very good. I think we have to stop. It's been an amazing session. Guys, thank you very yeah, yeah. much. It was awesome. I'm sorry about the uh, technical difficulties. I, I hope people got the, the gist of things uh, despite that. It was perfect. No, it was, for mm -hmm. sure. Everybody were, was able to, to understand. I'm sure about that. <laughs> no. So thank you no. both, guys. Thank you very much for attending today. This was an amazing session. Share with your colleagues, share with your team the YouTube link so everybody can uh, uh, learn more with this amazing lecture and with the discussion. And see you guys soon, Mary. Thank you very much. I hope we can continue our series in normal. I'm waiting for the Absolutely. date for the, for the Epstein. Huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Great, Bye. Thank uh, you, taste, um, Bye. Bye, Norman. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>